and it had in Colorado, but I didn't have the details, was that the rhythm, the period of Demiran's persisting rhythms, was compensated for temperature change, just what James II wanted of his chronometers. Good clocks that don't go fast or slow when the temperature changes. What happened here is to use a piece of engineering jargon that doesn't help you at all, but it's a transient due to the strong step down from 26 to 16. That clock never sees 10 degree steps in nature, and it, and it gets fooled by the big step. But if it's a gradual change, it doesn't see them. Now, so we had temperature compensated clocks. And I'm going to take, if I may, just five minutes to round out the second two thirds of my lecture. By 1960, it became clear. And I picked 1960 because there was a big and in our field famous symposium on all of this in 60. It became clear that from the point of view of an evolutionary biologist, and if you're not an evolutionary biologist, you're not a biologist, became clear to the evolutionary biologist that what we were looking at was the response of living things to natural selection in a world which from the beginning has been day periodic due to the Earth's rotation. And the periodicity of the environmental cycle, light, dark, hot, cold, and many other things derivative from that, that environmental periodicity is exquisitely predictable with the predictability of celestial mechanics that got us onto the moon. Natural selection not only can count on the sun coming up tomorrow, but when it'll come up tomorrow. And what has happened in the history of life has been the evolution. It would be nice to talk about how this might have happened, but don't have time. The evolution of what amounts to temporal programs. The organism's a computer, and there's built-in software that gives a time sequence to various events. And when that program's brought into phase with local time, green plants open their stomata just ahead of time to get ready for the business of exchanging gases. Chloroplast genes are turned on, photosynthetic apparatus largely turned off at night. I give you two other examples, give you one other example. Among animals, there's a little worm, Filaria, F-I-L-A-R-I-A, -I which is responsible in two and a half million human beings for this disgusting disease, Filariasis. Filari, never mind, it says somewhere here. It's a little nematode worm that lives deep in the tissues of the body of the patient. It's transmitted from person to person by a mosquito who goes and takes a blood meal from the peripheral bloodstream, goes to someone else and takes a blood meal, and in so doing, transfers the larvae in its spit, if you will. The mosquito only flies at certain times of day, and the filaria worm comes from deep tissues out into the peripheral bloodstream in time to be picked up by the mosquito that it's going to transmit it. It doesn't know this, don't get me wrong. The beautiful thing is that in the same filaria, in the Philippines and in India, the mosquito vector, one says, is different. And I've forgotten which is which. In one of them, the main flight is about 6 in the evening, and the other is Hours later, 9.30, 10, and the filaria, quote, unquote, know it. I mean, they don't know it, but they come out at the right time. They're programmed to come into the peripheral bloodstream at the right time to be picked up. There's a group of plants, green plants, that exploit very dry environments that carry off lacy. The problem with dry environments is you've got to open your stomata and the leaves to capture CO2 for photosynthesis. When you open your stomata, you lose water. So it's catch-22. 
except that in the Caryophyllaceae and many other green plants in Zurich, dry environments, the stomata are opened at night when the so-called when the saturation deficiency of the air, when the air is moister, they don't lose much water. They take in CO2 and they fix it in an energetically cheap reaction. It becomes malate, reacts with malic acid. And it's stored as malate until the morning when the stomata close, but light gets through, photosystems act activated, and CO2 is liberated from the malate to get into the Calvin cycle. And one could go on more about this. The process of CO2 of photosynthesis is broken up and structured in a temporal program relative to the challenges and the opportunities in the outside world. And that's what we're looking at. And I say it would, I wish that there were time to talk more about that. But there has been an evolution of programs. And those programs are structured by an oscillator, a periodic system that's measuring off essentially 24, a, a period that is a reasonable match to the Earth's rotation. Why it isn't 24 hours exactly, we think we know. That's another story. The clock, the oscillator, is brought into time, into phase with local time, and made exactly 24 hours by locking on to the light-dark cycle, much in the way one electronic oscillator can lock on to another and follow its frequency exactly. And in the history of life, those programs have been used not only to temporarily tempus time, temporarily organize events in the course of the day, but to function as a clock in celestial navigation. That's common. Many other organisms and bees and other insects, fish, many animals. And I, that's a long story. Many animals use this circadian clock for navigation by the sun. It's used by bees in what Miss Bailing called Zeitgedächtnis, time memory of bees. When a bee discovers a flower is producing nectar at 3 o'clock on this side of the road on Monday, it comes back on this side of the road 5 to 3 on Tuesday looking for the nectar. And finally, to finish this off there, the same clock is used by plants and animals in some way, the details of which we don't know. But circadian clocks are used to measure the duration of darkness at night. There's a whole class of phenomena in which animals and plants seasonally do something or don't do it. Hibernate, don't hibernate. Reproductive organs grow, mold, bloom, lots of things. Flower, don't flower. To a very large extent, those seasonal activities are triggered by a specific range of dark durations at night. It's called photoperiodism, but the crucial thing is the duration of the darkness. It doesn't matter. And the circadian clock is used for that. It's known that a single cell can do it. Victor Bruce and I discovered this in 56, and there's a huge literature on, on single cells since. There's a large literature, which you're going to learn a lot about in this course, addressing the questions, what is the clock and where is it in the animal? In the single cell, that's a good question. In the multicellular animal, do all cells have clocks? Not clear, probably not. And it's known that in different animals, the group of cells that function as a clock have been localized in the base of the hypothalamus and well, in the hypothalamus and humans and other vertebrates, other mammals, pineal gland and birds and in insects. What part of the insect brain? It's known where the clock is. <coughs> there is a great deal of action at the moment trying to find out the chemistry of the clock. What, what is the clock? This temperature compensated oscillator. And there's also a great interest, obviously, in the clock of humans. And you have clocks, good ones. If you were locked up in a, an experimental room and left alone with food available and everything else you wanted, except liquor, yeah. <laughs> you would uh, be found to have a circadian period of about 25 hours. 
which persists with the kind of precision you're seeing in this mouse here. And that human clock is thought to underlie, in fact, it surely does, the phenomena of jet lag. People who work shift, court, shift work are constantly resetting their clocks. And there's some evidence that that is deleterious. There is evidence, some of which, which I exploit. I'm an asthmatic, and I take steroids. You take the steroids in the early morning, because my adrenal, when it's working properly, pulses out steroids in the early morning. If I take the steroids at another time of day, there are bad side effects. So there's a growing field of chronopharmacology. I haven't told you, and you'll see from the work of a laboratory in Minnesota, Halberg and his colleagues. In mice, for instance, if you look at, as they have, over a dozen, probably two dozen, I never counted exactly how many, different physiological functions, the time at which one's enzymes, specific activities at a maximum, blood pressure, heartbeat rate, da -dum, all of these functions are coming to a maximum at different times of day. There's a program in the mouse that is organizing the temporal structure, the structure in time of what the mouse does. And working all that out is the challenge for you people in the future. And what I'm sorry about for you is that you're not going to be able to answer such questions with an abandoned outhouse. Thank you. for me, I, it's one of the... I